Hello, Hollywood Time viewers. Today, we welcome actor, producer, comedian, and author, Ryan O'Quinn. Hey, Ryan, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. And where are you calling in from? I am actually in Little Rock, Arkansas right now. We are on our promo tour. I've been on the road for about a week now and uh, started in LA. We had our, our Los Angeles premiere last week, and then uh, we took off and trekked across the country in the last four days, I was in uh, Bristol, Tennessee, Grundy, Virginia, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina yesterday, and Little Rock today. So, And for my viewers out there, Ryan's talking about Paul's Promise. And it is one amazing movie, folks. I've watched it, and you need uh, not one or two, but a whole box of Kleenex. I, I've heard that more than once. And we, in fact, we toyed with the idea of handing people uh, Kleenexes when they come into the theater. But you uh, should. They should have had a little logo that had Paul's promise on there because yes. oh like, there's yeah. no way you can watch that movie without crying. I, I've seen it, uh, you know, as you can imagine, a hundred times or more. And I still get a lump every time. It's just such a powerful, true story. And I think that's partly what makes it even more, uh, you know, more emotional and more powerful, but just an incredible, obviously, I'm biased, but uh, a really great story, in my opinion. I'm so sorry I missed your, um, you were in Thousand Oaks here a couple of days ago and I missed it. How did this movie come to you? Tell us about that. Yeah, good question. We, you know, my company, uh, speaking of Thousand Oaks, my company is in, in Westlake Village, uh, you know, near LA. And um, we, the name of my company is Damascus Road Productions. And as you might be able to glean, we, we focus on faith and family movies. So that's kind of our forte. And um, there was a, a producer, an executive producer on the East Coast named Nick Logan, who came across the story a couple of years ago. And it was based on a book called Brother Paul. It's the, uh, the true story of a, by his own admission, a racist firefighter turned pastor in the height of the civil rights movement of, of the late 1960s. And so he, he was not a good guy early on. He, uh, he had a, a black childhood best friend and, and then later on in life turned his back on his best friend. And the story is the sort of the journey of how they reconnected later in life and how uh, Paul, the title character, ends up starting a church of all things. But um, the, it's based on a book, which was Paul Holderfield Sr.'s autobiography. And uh, that was turned into a screenplay. And a producer uh, in North Carolina um, spoke with the original executive producer, and they, uh, he and I had some projects we were doing together. So they brought it to my company at Damascus Road and asked if we would be interested in partnering and coming alongside. And, and as soon as I read the script, and my wife, Heather, who's, uh, who's co-partner with me in the company, uh, as soon as we both read it, we knew we had to tell this story. And so we, we started straight away. We filmed it in 2020. Uh, I highly do not recommend shooting a movie in the height of a global pandemic, but Praise God, somehow, some way we, we pulled it off, uh, but uh, we, we wrapped it up in late 2020 and are, and are finally uh, hitting theaters all over the country starting this week. Oh, my goodness. I wanted to ask, because I wasn't sure when you filmed it, you know, how do you film it and what happened like with your actors and everything during the pandemic? Did did anyone get COVID? Uh, how did that work? Yeah, it was it was quite a quite an undertaking to say the least. We were among the first uh, that were invited back to, uh, to, to shoot, you know, the, all of the unions and uh, the protocols with the, the Screen Actors Guild and the American Federation of Television Radio Artists and, and the unions that were involved, obviously stringent protocols, which still exist, most of them still today. Uh, but we were among the first that was sort of guinea pigged and, and granted access to, to go into production. So, we were at the time um, sort of beta testing protocols that are still still going on, including three zones, for example. There's an A zone, B zone, and C zone, and sort of exactly what it sounds like. A zone is just the actors and the director, those that are closest to each other and are literally in each other's faces. And the B zone is the crew that's sort of around that, but not right with the actors. And then C zone is more administrative and more uh, you know office personnel that's not on set necessarily all the time. Anyway, it was it was quite an undertaking. We hired, you know, in, starting in the, in the summer of 2020, there are two line items, for example, on a, uh, a, a budget, a feature film budget that never existed prior to, to that time, uh, the COVID compliance officer and a health and safety supervisor. Mm -hmm. And again, their jobs are exactly what it sounds like, but it's just to try to maintain protocol, keep distancing, keep masks. You have to test every other day if you're in zone A. And, you know, we were in... Um, just give you a quick example of some of the headaches that we were dealing with, but um, we had to test every other day and the test results had to come back within 72 hours 
but the turnaround time for the lab was a minimum of five days. So we were, we couldn't figure out how best to, to meet the union's uh, demands and protocols with the, the testing lab that they recommended, you know, suggested or, or demanded that we had to use. So it was something else. Um, you know, we, on the other side of it, we can exhale a little bit and laugh, but our cast was just so gracious. And, and uh, we did at one point get shut down. In fact, about 12 weeks into principal photography, we shut down because of, of COVID um, protocols. We had a couple of positive cases on set and, and the, the unions shut us down for good reason. And we sort of regrouped and came back uh, about six weeks later, we came back and finished the movie actually in Los Angeles. So there's a, an interesting bit of irony in that we started the, the movie, of course, the development and the pre-production phase started in my office in Westlake Village. And, uh, and actually finished the movie and actually shot uh, the, the last few scenes of the movie in the studio there in, in the, the West Valley. So kind of some interesting, uh, you know, uh, full circle to that. And since it was uh, around a firefighter, did you bring in real firefighters to work with at all? How did yeah. that work? Yeah, absolutely. We were so, we shot the movie in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico, uh, of all places. <laughs> the movie takes place in Little Rock, Arkansas, but we didn't shoot in Little Rock and for a barrage of reasons, we were in uh, truth or consequences. And with Hollywood magic, we make it look like Little Rock, yeah. but um, we engaged the local fire department, the uh, Williamsburg Fire Department, as well as the truth or consequences fire department in New Mexico. And so we, uh, as you watch the movie, we infiltrate and integrate uh, the real firefighters alongside the actors. And of course, you know, all those safety protocols are in effect, needless to say, and where there were safe words and, you know, if something got out of control, they would have taken over. And so um, we're all in period attire, you know, it's set in the, in the late sixties, as I mentioned. And so we're in period fire trucks and, and period clothing. And we have uh, real firefighters alongside us battling real blazes as we burn down a house two times. Yeah, that was pretty amazing. Everything's so realistic. You, you guys did a great job. Thank you. Uh, let's talk about the cast. How did that come about? Amazing cast. Amazing cast indeed. And, you know, we are so fortunate. I've said it a few times, you know, you in, when you're in the pre-production phase, you make a short list, um, as you can imagine, of people. Wouldn't it be great if yeah. dot, 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 you, you make your short list of actors that you would love to be in this movie? And we ended up getting every single person that we wanted. That was our first choice. So um, Linda Pearl, who plays my mother in the movie, just to, I mean, a, a, a veteran actress for sure. She's won a number of Best Actress Awards for this film, I'm proud to say. And she plays um, the role of Minnie Holderfield, my, my mother in the movie, with, with aplomb. She is just extraordinary. And her emotion and, and just everything about her performance is fantastic. And thankfully, film festivals around the country have acknowledged that. Joseph Cannon, who plays opposite me, he plays a character named Jimmy Lipkin, who was Paul's best friend. Uh, early on and then ultimately later in life. And, and Joseph has been amazing every step of the way. He was originally brought in as a writer of all things. And we asked him to, to speak into the script and, and, and give us an African-American perspective on the storyline. And, uh, and when he did, we realized that, that number one, he was, in addition to being an incredibly talented writer, he's an extraordinary actor. And we knew we had to cast him straight away as the role of, of Jimmy Lipkin. Sherry Rigby plays my wife. She's extraordinary. She's been in a number of projects that your, your um, audience would would know and so she came in at the very end uh, we wanted her in the beginning and she was moving she was physically moving from los angeles to atlanta and couldn't do it and then later on unbeknownst to us her mother actually passed away uh, a couple of weeks prior to when we we started to uh, when we needed her to film those scenes and we didn't know that so kind of as a last resort i called her up and said hey is there any possible way and she was so gracious to come in uh, and and do that with us. Nancy Stafford uh, plays Mama's best friend in the movie, and a, cr a great role. Just a Southern, uh, feisty grandma character who who brings some levity and and comedy to the to the to a kind of a heavy storyline. And she's excellent. And I can't leave out my buddy Dean Kane. And you know you know you know Dean from 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 everything, and, and yeah. not the least of which is Superman. So uh, Dean plays my boss in the uh, in the film, the the chief of the firefighters, and he was fantastic. Just an incredibly talented cast all the way around. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, because it's you know I could see why you were nominated for best actor, and the film won best picture uh, at different film festivals. That must make you so proud. It was, you know, we, we when you're in the thick of it, you, you never think about um, uh, 
awards and laurels, or at least I don't, you know, you're, you're mm -hmm. going 12, 14 hour days and you're just trying to hold it all together. And we often say you're in the trenches. And so the last thing that's on your mind is, well, the first thing that's on your mind is just get the shot, just finish the day. And then finally, when you, you know, have it in the can and you see the first cut, you're like, okay, we've got something here, but I don't know if anybody will get this or if audiences will appreciate this. And so to be on the other side of it now and to have won multiple awards for this film and including six, I think we're up to six best picture awards at film festivals around the country. And uh, every member of the cast has been honored as well as the director uh, at various film festivals. And it's, it's just a real, um, a real blessing and just a real um, a pat on the back, not for me, but certainly for our crew and the whole team that put this together that, that audiences are, are recognizing that uh, on the other side of it. Well, congratulations, you guys deserve that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Now, you said you and your wife got the script uh, and then you read it and you're going to be the actor that's playing, you know, Paul. What did, what research? What did you have to do? Because I didn't like you in that movie. Yeah, that that, too, is a compliment. And, you know, I wasn't <laughs> supposed to play the uh, I wasn't supposed to play that role. And, uh, you know, we were we were set to produce. And, and while I have an acting background and, and the bulk of my career is as an actor, uh, that was not the reason we greenlit it, nor was that the original plan. But as we read it and as we, we dived into it more, my wife was the first to say, you know, this, I grew up in the South. And uh, and um, interestingly, my, uh, my father's relationship, my dad in real life, my father's relationship with his mother, my grandmother, was very similar to Paul in the movie, Paul's relationship with his mother. Just a really interesting kind of mother-son relationship and a, you know, a, a prayer warrior of a, of a mother type that's constantly praying for her son. And, and it was just a, and, and of course the, the executive producer and the screenwriter had no way of knowing that when they sent it to us, but my wife was the first to say that. And I agreed, but kept my mouth shut. And then the executive producer reached out to my wife, not my agents or managers and not to me even, but reached out and said, do you think Ryan would consider playing this role? So it was, it was, good that it came from, you know, came from him and, and not from us. But uh, I, I stepped into that role and, and I truly, I count it as a highlight of my professional career to be able to bring this story to the big screen. And in answer to your question, the, the real family was so gracious in giving me, in my opinion, unparalleled access to, um, to his life. And by that, I mean, um, videos, real archival footage of him uh, preaching, you know, from the pulpit at their church, um, um, uh, uh, home video footage, um, his notes, his pastor's journal, his diary. And so really being able to watch videos and, and sort of tackle the character from the outside in, firstly, making sure I got that accent correct and making sure I had the, the walk and the talk down and the physicality down, but being also able to look at his journals and his diaries and his, you know, just his his heart-wrenching thoughts on paper and his sermon notes that were handwritten and to sort of look from the inside out as to what made this man tick was, was truly extraordinary. And as I mentioned, we're here, I'm here in Little Rock right now. And so tomorrow night, opening night, October 21st, uh, we will be sitting with the real Holderfield family. The son of the man that I play is in his late sixties now and stepped into his father's shoes and is the senior pastor of that church now here in North Little Rock. And so they will be seeing it for the first time alongside us and we'll be witnessing and watching together this movie and, and incredible legacy of their father brought to life on the big screen. Oh, I wish I could be there. That's got to be amazing. You've got to give them Kleenex, that's for sure. I, yeah, I, I expect that somebody will have those at the ready. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was uh, like you were saying, it was an emotional you know, movie for me to watch. I had to like actually stop a couple of times because I, I, you know, I'm a religious woman, Catholic, and my uh, youngest son doesn't believe and it's so seeing that just I'm going to cry right now, you know, trying to struggle with with him. It's like I want him to see this movie. Yeah, it, we, touched, you know, it touched my heart. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. And we've heard that multiple times. We've screened it, as I mentioned, across the country this week, just with select audiences. And and uh, we've gotten that exact same comment, actually, a number of times of, of uh, parents, mothers in particular, who are praying for prodigal children and saying that this movie gave them hope. And you know, last night I uh, we were at the church here. We had the opportunity to to speak at and and do a Q and A at the church, um, Friendly Chapel Church here, which is the church that Paul Holderfield started all those years ago. It was never the plan to start a church. It just sort of spawned out of a a soup kitchen and a homeless shelter that he started here in the inner city of North Little Rock. 
and we had a chance to um, to meet with several people who several congregants who knew the real Paul Holderfield. He passed away in 1998, and many of those uh, folks in the church knew him and and walked with him and talked with him daily and attended services regularly. And um, and several of them came up to me and said that uh, uh, that they there was a couple of women in particular that regularly prayed with Paul's mother. You know, when he was when he Paul was in his 20s and was um, was not walking in faith and, and they were, uh, they came alongside his mother and were just her support system and praying for her children. And, uh, and sure enough, you know, several, all those years later, uh, the, the fervent prayers availeth much as, you know, as it says, and, uh, and Paul made a complete 180 in his life and, and started serving the Lord. And that made all the difference. Yeah. You know, going through, uh, the pandemic COVID in this last couple of years and the, world besides the united states is in trouble you know and this is the kind of movies that we need for everyone to watch you know it just it, it grounds you it just makes you think about your life you know yeah. and, thank you for saying that and i and i think so too i think among other things you know if there if, if there's any any semblance of a takeaway people have asked me that a couple of times you know i, I think that um, just taking a page from Paul's life, uh, you know, he never, as I mentioned, he never set out to start a church. That was not his plan at all. He he didn't even set out to uh, to to change Little Rock or to change his neighborhood or change his community. It was simply one man who looked at the words of the Bible and tried to figure as best he could, how does this apply to me and, and what am I to do with this? And uh, in his case, he realized, you know, uh, the error of his ways and realized that, number one, discrimination in all forms is not biblical and and specifically racism is not biblical. And secondly, he said, this will not stand on my watch. And he stood up to um, the injustice of the day that he saw around him and became an extraordinary civil rights advocate and, and by way of the church um, started one of the first integrated churches in the American South that is still going strong today. I was there this morning. We were there for their annual fish fry and their their give back oh. community. And our whole cast and crew came together and partnered with that church and literally rolled up our sleeves and and made uh, put together nearly 4,000 meals to take to um, the homeless of Little Rock and to various prison ministries and, and correctional facilities around around this area. Yeah. So where is the film going to be shown as of tomorrow mm -hmm. tomorrow the the premiere is here in little rock uh mm -hmm. it was where we will be but it's shown all over the country the best way to uh, to find out where it'll be at a theater near you near your audience is to go to paulspromisemovie.com all the information you need is right there including the trailer right on the home page but there's a tab that says theaters and you just click on that tab paulspromisemovie.com slash theaters and populate your zip code and it'll tell you where it's playing near you if it happens to not be playing near you um, for this opening weekend and next week you can click on the demand tab and it's exactly what it sounds like you just fill out a quick thing and then the plan is to uh, to bring the movie theater if there's enough demand to people all over the country but it's opening in hundreds of theaters around america starting tomorrow night friday the 21st oh that is definitely a, a movie that we will help to promote uh, as much as we can because it's unfortunately I say there's too many Pauls out there back in the day and we need people to see that so they can become the better Paul you know? exactly yeah I, you know you, you think about the the story and and you know uh, arguably how long it's taken to, to get to the screen you know e even 50 plus years ago when the, when the story actually happened and and I've said several times and uh, that arguably now more than ever we are still in the in the zeitgeist of, of examining where we are as a country mm -hmm. and where are we, uh, particularly when it in, in, involves race relations and, and what are next steps within this country. So when we were filming, uh, you know, in the fall of 2020, it was shortly after George Floyd was in the headline and, and it yeah. just, you know, amazing to see headlines and, and things happening across the country that were, were not too far away from from what had happened in the, you know, years prior and uh, and and to be able to shoot this movie in a formerly segregated town and then to be able to bring the premiere back to this same spot and to uh to be arms akimbo with with some of the folks that were there when it happened is going to be truly special for us tomorrow night oh i know like i said if you live there people go <laughs> you go to exactly. Exactly. definitely go out to the movies i will be taking my best friend uh with me tomorrow night to find right. where it is where we are so i can yeah. see it on the big screen Exactly. Pop on the, pop on that website and uh, and it'll it, pop in your zip code and it'll tell you exactly where to go see it. And from the website, you can buy tickets directly from the site. So just click oh, on you that. Can? 
time. Yes, paulspromisemovie.com slash theaters and you can purchase tickets right there and pick your seat. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Well, there's a lot more to talk to you about and I was hoping maybe we could have another interview so we could talk all about uh, Ryan. Today, we just wanted to get this out about the movie, but I'd really like to be able to catch up with you so we could talk to you more about the rest of your career that you've been doing and what's coming up. Do you have something else coming up soon? I do. We have another movie coming out. In fact, not too far, not too uh, uh, long from now. Another feature called Bringing Back Christmas uh, that opens in theaters on December 2nd, and it's a Christmas comedy. Uh, so you have to look for that. And then early next year, I start a movie in South Africa, and I'm really excited about that one as well. So you have to, to stay tuned. But I'd love to come back anytime and, and share with you about those. That would be great. Yeah, we'll come back in the at uh, the end of November and talk about your the, the Christmas movie because it'll be that time. Yes, it will. I'm I'm happy to do it. You have any closing words for us today? Uh, I do. I, you know, I, I would just love to say that that I honestly believe that um, you know, with all the the programming that's out there and on all of the options that there are right now, uh, this is this is my personal opinion. But I think we need more family movies. I think we need more wholesome movies. Um, I said recently in, a, in another interview, I want to be able to sit with my grandmother on one side of me and my son, you know, my 10 year old son on the other side of me and be able to watch something together as a family and not have to slink down in that seat and not have to cringe at what, I, what I'm seeing. And so with all the, the fare that's out there, I think this movie is excellent counter programming that can be enjoyed by audiences of all ages and have a real solid, meaningful takeaway and a real message of hope on the other side of it that I think will up, uplift the spirits, uh, the spirit of your audience and audiences all over the country. So uh, please go see it. Very well said. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time. My pleasure. See you soon.